Okay, so <clears throat> this section is uh, getting into the logic aspects. So just like the um, previous section, it's going to go through uh, each position for logic, and it's going to start out with an intro. Um, I, re I read ahead, um, you know, just to kind of give myself an idea of what's coming up. And I recall now that there are some big chunks, especially in the first logic section, that uh, are just, I think, completely the reverse of the case. <laughs> um, uh, and I'll explain why when we get to those. Um, and yeah, some of this, some of it just doesn't sound right to me, but. Um, just bear with it, and I think there's still some good stuff in here. Um, and the title, uh, Simplicity is Enough for Any Wise, um, I think that's supposed to be saying uh, simplicity is enough for any sage or any wise man. Um, so just in case you were curious about that. Okay, it seems obvious. Logic, as a mental function, should be much younger than emotion, meaning it should, it should have come after emotion. After all, love in living beings clearly precedes thinking and is completely uncontrollable by it, which is easy to confirm by observations of human nature, uh, observations of human nature, not to mention animals. It's like that. But without entering into a dispute about priorities, Nevertheless, I will take the liberty of doubting this truth and suggesting that logic is not inferior in antiquity to emotions. I proceed from the fact that life, even, its even in its most primitive forms, is so complex and multivariate that solving all problems willy-nilly requires the work of the intellect, otherwise you won't survive. In this regard, I will cite the observation of the rem remarkable biologist Conrad Lorenz, at one time, he was engaged in experiments with a variety of, uh, I think it's uh, cichlid fishes, maybe, or checklid? I'm not sure. Uh, an interesting feature of whose behavior was that the male, collecting the fry in the nest, meaning I, I think the fry is like the, the young, the tiny little young fish, um, does not waste time on persuasion, but simply takes them into his spacious mouth and swimming up to the nest spits them out into the inlet. One day, Lorenz witnessed the following scene. Having thrown several worms to the bottom of the aquarium, he saw how the male, who had previously been scurrying around the aquarium in search of his fry, grabbed one worm and began to chew it. But then a fry swimming past caught his eye. Then this is what happened. The male shuddered as if stung, rushed after the small fish, and stuffed it into his already filled mouth. So he put, he put the baby fish into his mouth, as he usually does to transport them but he was also eating a worm, remember. Um, it was an exciting moment. The fish held two completely different things in its mouth, one of which it had to send to its, into its stomach and the other into the nest. How will she do? I must confess that at that moment I would not have given two pence for the life of the tiny precious fish, but an amazing thing happened. The male stood motionless with his mouth full, but not chewing. If ever, if I ever, ever thought that a fish thinks, it was at this moment. This is absolutely wonderful that a fish can find itself in a truly difficult situation, and in this case it behaved exactly as a person would behave if he were in its place. For several seconds she, she stood motionless, as if unable to find a way out of the situation, and one could almost see how tense all her feelings were. So the, the thing is, I'm not sure about this, I, I think... It's supposed to be a male fish, but the translation is defaulting to a female gender, but this is a male fish they're talking about. Um, one could almost see how tense all his feelings were. Then he resolved the contradictions in a way that cannot but cause admiration. He spat out the entire contents onto the bottom of the aquarium. Uh, then the father resolutely walked towards the worm and leisurely began to eat it, all the while glancing with one eye at the young one, which obediently lay on the bottom. Having finished with the worm, the male took the fry and took it home to his mother. How tense all her feelings were. Maybe that, that, that's supposed to be um, how, how tense all his feelings were. Um, 
Then she resol then he resolved the contradictions in a way that cannot but cause that. Okay, now oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes the translation just starts repeating again and again. Um, so right there it starts re repeating again. So basically what happened was the male fish usually transports the baby fish in its mouth, but it was chewing, chewing a worm and it still felt the need to put the baby fish in its mouth. And then it was like, oh, I can't bite down on baby. So it took a few moments as if it was thinking and then spat the baby out, washed it closely, ate the worm, and then carried the baby back to the nest. All right. Several students who witnessed the scene flinched when one person began to applaud. Uh, together with Lorenz, having applauded and rejoiced for the fish, I want to note that no matter how elementary the logical task was in this case, and no matter how painfully the fish coped with it, it involuntarily deprived the person of the aura of exclusivity due to its, his, uh, due to its supposedly undivided possession of a, such a great treasure, like the mind. So in other words... You know, if, you know, fish have minds, I guess, so, you know, people, I guess, aren't so special. Um, however, the times when a person laid claim to intellectual birthright have apparently already passed. Just as time seems to pass when superiority is seen in the weight and volume of his brain or in the number of convolutions. By all these parameters, a person is unlikely to be able to claim the title of undisputed leader of the animal world. Yes, and apparently it's not a matter of parameters. The great science uh, Louis Pasteur became a luminary of science with one half of his brain. The other was atrophied. I didn't know that. Uh, while a resident of Florida, whose brain turned out to be the heaviest of all known, remained nameless even for the meticulous compilers of the book Guinness, the Guinness World Records. The question arises, if not brain parameters and not intellectual primogeniture, then what made a person a thinking reed and awarded the species of animals the title sapiens? I will take a risk and give a completely heretical explanation of the human phenomenon, based, of course, on the principles of psychosophy. The essence of the human phenomenon is not in the presence or absence of logic and not in the quality of the tools that we have for its implementation. But in the position of logic at the levels of the functional hierarchy. So this is a pretty, this is a pretty big idea here. So bear with him. Um, it was once very true and expressively noted that the mind is the super fang of a person, meaning kind of like a, the, the animal weapon of human beings is the mind, right? Uh, everything is correct with that. But let us remember psychosophy. A person's main weapon in the fight is the functions located at the top. The fourth logic, no matter what class of beings its bearer belongs to, does not recognize thinking as a powerful weapon and even turns it off, like any fourth function on the eve of, con the eve of a conflict. Therefore, the intellectual barrier is not between people and animals, but between those with logic above and those with logic below. There is nothing offensive here. Everyone thinks, and the quality of intellectual work does not depend at all on the position of logic on the steps of the functional ladder. The only question is to what extent logic is supportive self-valuable, authoritative, reliable, lethal for the individual's mental sense of self, or conversely, secondary and ineffective. Let's remember the fish from Lorenz's aquarium. How could we forget? Uh, he thought, but his thinking was quite typical for the fourth logic. The activation of intellect occurred only at the moment of the need for choice, under the pressure of external circumstances. For her, intellectual work was not valuable in its in. Uh, excuse me, also my place here. For her, uh, I'm meaning him. It's supposed to be him. For him, intellectual work was not valuable in itself, um, existing as an internal need, independent of external circumstances. Uh, Claparide, uh, Claparade, Claparade. I'm not sure. Uh, the founder of Zoo Psychology wrote that in animals, intelligence is activated when instinctive or acquired automatism is not capable of solving a behavioral problem. That is, Lorenz's fish itself was not stupid, it was just too practical and mentally lazy to become human. <laughs> well, okay. Um, the essence of the intellectual boundary, which runs through the entire cosmos of living beings, is that individuals with the fourth logic perceive thinking as a means, while individuals with a higher logic perceive it as a goal with all the gains and losses ensuing from this circumstance. Okay. Uh, therefore, the origin of the human phenomenon in the light of psychosophy is seen as follows. 
At first, the entire animal world, including proto-man, had the fourth logic. But one fine day, due to, due to an unclear combination of circumstances, mutation, climate changes, etc., some representatives of the proto-human race... <laughs> this, is, this is hilarious, but the translation, transver, the translation really shits it up here. Um, it says, some representatives of the proto-human race, and then in all caps, it says... Logic crapped up. Okay. I, I think it's supposed to be like some representatives of the pro proto-human race crept crept up in logic, not crapped up in logic. <laughs> On this day, the phenomenon of man was born. Not being smarter than his relatives, the owner of higher ranking logic simply had a different attitude towards the very process of thinking, considering it to be valuable, supporting lethal. He considered it to he considered it so without yet having any ev evidence for this simply by virtue of his own order of functions new for the proto-human world. A gigantic intellectual explosion occurred, according to one biologist. The unprecedented happened. Man largely escaped the influence of natural selection, unfinished, and remained that way forever. And man emerged from the influence of selection because the main condition of uh, success was not genetically transmitted information, but extragenically transmitted knowledge. It was not those who were better structured who began to survive, uh, who had better genes, in other words, um, but those who better used the acquired and growing knowledge with each generation about how to build, how to get food, how to protect themselves from diseases, how to live. But the most important thing is that next to pragmatic thinking, there is fundamental thinking thinking that is valuable in its own right, existing independently of the shocks and circumstances of the external environment. Modern society is only now growing to realize the need to finance fundamental research, i.e. satisfying, as they say, one's idle, one's idle curiosity at someone else's expense. But in fact, regardless of funding sources, basic research has existed as long as modern man has existed. The question arises, who was Socrates? Who sat on the neck of his wife, uh, Xanthippe, I think it is? Um, and in endless conversations, tried to understand the essence of philosophical categories that were far from everyday life. He was a typical represented, representative of high-ranking logic, an idle curiosity, a supporter of the self-valued flexing of intellectual muscles, an adept of the theory of thinking for the sake of thinking. But no matter how angry the voluntary or unwitting sponsors of fundamental intellectualism may be, in the end, their contributions never go to waste. Strategic gain always remains with the representative of high-ranking logic. And if now we see the world as it is, uh, with all its pros and cons, then only he bears responsibility for this. It was he who gave the entire earth into the power of man, and perhaps prepared for its destruction. However, no matter how the future fate of the planet turns out, the decisive role will continue to be played by the motor of the last stage of ev evolutionary development, high-ranking logic. Okay. Uh, the reader is probably already dreaming of the image of a future man, typical of some magazine illustrations, a body like a blade of grass, on top of which dangles a bald skull the size of a pumpkin. No, you can be calm here. I repeat, the point is not in the structure of the skull and not in anthropology at all but in the order of functions, in which logic, by the will of fate, ends up at the top. Therefore, anthropological metamorphoses are not expected. I also don't foresee a future numerical dominance of intellectuals. There are still very few of them, and since a person's love program is focused on emotional people, as was discussed a lot in the previous chapter, it will take at least millennia before logic begins to seriously compete with emotion in the struggle for procreation. Very interesting paragraph there. Um, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's of interest how he puts logic at the top, right? Logic is the apex. Um, but he also reserves a, you know, I, I, he kind of gives like a fair, a fair shake for each of the aspects in terms of their value. Um, although, of course, will, uh, he seems to place like as the most important, um, and that is something that I've, I've seen other psychosophy people do around the web. It's like the will or volition is like the most important aspect. But 
personally, I think they're, they seem to be all equally of, of importance. Um, but yeah, it's, it's in here, he's kind of making logic seem like it's, it's at the apex. So that's, yeah, just something to know, I guess. Um, however, the time has come to move from global problems to specific ones and begin to analyze the ways of expressing logic depending on its position on the levels of the functional hierarchy. All carriers of this function are divided into dogmatists, first logic, rhetors, second logic, skeptics, third logic, and scholars, fourth logic. So <clears throat> for the uh, first emotion, um, I think I read the first emotion, or I'm sorry, I read the emotion intro, and then I went with first emotion, but for these, uh, for this one, I'm going to stop it here and make this a separate video. So there you go.